Chapter Two of Mary, A Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ipa Gonzalez. Chapter Two. In due time, she brought forth a son, a feeble babe, and the following year a daughter. After her mother threw, she felt very few sentiments of maternal tenderness. The children were given to nurses, and she played with the dogs. One of exercise prevented the least chance of her recovering strength, and two or three milk fevers brought on her consumption, to which her constitution tended. Her children all died in her infancy, except the two first, and she began to grow fond of the son, as he was remarkably handsome. For years she divided her time between the sofa and a card table. She thought not of death, though in the borders of the grave, nor did any of the duties of her station occur to her as necessary. Her children were left in the nursery, and when Mary, the little blushing girl, appeared, she would send the awkward thing away. To own the truth, she was awkward enough, in a house without any playmates, for her brother had been sent to school, and she scarcely knew how to employ herself. She would ramble about the garden, admire the flowers, and play with the dogs. An old housekeeper told her stories, read to her, and, at last, taught her how to read. Her mother talked of anchoring for a governess when her health would permit, and, in the interim, desired her own maid to teach her French. As she had learned to read, she perused with avidity every book that came in her way, neglected in every respect, and left to the operation of her own mind. She considered everything that came under her inspection, and learned to think she had heard of a separate state, and that angels sometimes visited the earth. She was sick in a thick wood, in a park, and talked to them, make little songs addressed to them, and sing to them tunes of her own composing, and her native wood notes wild with sweet and touching. Her father always exclaimed against female acquirements, and was glad that his wife's indolence and ill health made her not trouble herself about them. She had besides another reason. She did not wish to have a fine tall girl brought forward into notice as a daughter. She still expected to recover, and figure away into the gay world. Her husband was very tyrannical and passionate, indeed so very easily irritated, when abbreviated, that Mary was continually in dread lest he should frighten her mother to death. His sickness called for all Mary's tenderness and exercised her compassion so continually, that it became more than a match for self-love and was the governing propensity of her heart through life. She was violent in her temper, but she saw her father's faults, and would weep to oblige to compare his temper with her own. She did more, artless praise raised to heaven for pardon, when she was conscious of having erred, and her contrition was so exceedingly painful that she watched diligently the first movements of anger and impatience to save herself this cruel remorse. Sublime ideas filled her young mind, always connected with devotional sentiments, extemporary effusion of gratitude, and rhapsodies of praise would burst often from her. When she listened to the birds, or pursued the deer, she would gaze on the moon and ramble through the gloomy path, observing the various shapes the clouds assume, and listened to the sea that was not far distant. The wandering spirits, which she imagined inhabited every part of nature, were her constant friends and confidants. She began to consider great first course, formed his notion of his attributes, and, in particular, dwelt on his wisdom and goodness. Could she have loved her father and mother? Had they returned her affection, she would not so soon, perhaps, have sought out a new world. Her sensibility prompted her to search for an object to love, and earth was not to be found. Her mother had often disappointed her, and the apparent partiality she showed to her brother gave her exquisite pain produce a kind of habitual melancholy, led her into a fondness for reading tales of woe, and made her almost realize her fictitious distress. She had not any notion of death till a little chicken expired at her feet, and her father had a dog hung in a passion. She then concluded animals had souls, or they would not have been subjected to the caprice of man. But what was the soul of man a beast? In this trial, year after year rolled on, her mother still vegetating. A little girl attended in the nursery fell sick. Mary paid her great attention. Contrary to her wishes, she was sent out of the house to her mother, a poor woman, whom necessity obliged to leave her sick child while she earned her daily bread. A poor wretch, in a fit of delirium, stabbed herself, and Mary saw a dead body. 
and heard the dismal accounts, and so strongly did it impress her imagination, that every night of her life the bleeding corpse presented itself to her when the first began to slumber. Tortured by it, she at last made a vow that if she was ever mistress of a family, she would herself watch over every part of it. The impression that this accident made was indelible. As her mother grew imperceptibly worse and worse, her father, who did not understand such a lingering complaint, imagined his wife as only grown still more whimsical, and that if she could be prevailed on to exert herself, her health would be soon reestablished. In general, he treated her with indifference, but when her illness at all interfered with his pleasures, he expostulated in a most cruel manner, and invisibly harassed the invalid. Mary would then assiduously try to turn his attention to someone else, and when sent out of the room, would watch at the door until the storm was over, for unless it was, she could not rest. Other causes also contributed to disturb her repose. Her mother's lukewarm manner of performing religious duties filled her with anguish, and when she observed her father's vices, the unbidden tears would flow. She was miserable when beggars were driven from the gate without being relieved. If she could do it unperceived, she would give them her own breakfast, and feel gratified when in consequence of it she was pinched by hunger. She had once or twice told her little secrets to her mother. They were laugh at, and she determined never to do it again. In this manner she was left to reflect on her own feelings, and so strengthened were they by being meditated on, that her character early became singular and permanent. Her understanding was strong and clear, but not clouded by feelings. She was too much the creature of impulse and the slave of compassion. End of chapter 2 Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavite, Philippines